I want to welcome everyone who's in person and who is online to Kent Rogers Science, what it is, what it isn't, and what it is good for. I, my name is Dennis Cooley. I am the director of the Northern Plains Ethics Institute, who runs the Science Religion Lunch Program. And we wanted to thank uh, our last speaker, Syed Ahmed, who gave a really interesting talk uh, last time that is available, by the way, in the Science Religion Lunch or uh, on the Northern Plains Ethics Institute's YouTube channel. So if you're interested in seeing any of those of these programs, you can see it there and watch it as many times as you would like, of course. Um, for November 16th, Tyler Waltz is going to be giving a talk on science communication and the media, which is also an important um, area to consider. But before, and so keep that on your schedule, but I want to get to this talk because I've got a lot to say about it. I think a lot of folks have a lot to say about this that'll be interesting. So our speaker is Kent Rogers, who is a full professor in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at NDSU. He teaches undergraduate and graduate courses in chemistry and directs a federally funded research program focused on the chemistry and biochemistry of hemes. I, I needed the globin in there, <laughs> for example, pig, blood pigment. The current emphasis of his research program is elucidation of heme homeostasis mechanisms in pathogenic bacteria. Based on this work, he, along with his students and colleagues, have contributed about 100 peer-reviewed papers and book chapters to the chemical and biochemical literature. Kent is a longtime attendee of science, religion, and lunch seminars. In fact, he was here way before I was. So let us welcome Kent Rogers. So thanks very much for uh, entertaining my request to speak. Uh, uh, Dennis, I appreciate that very much. Um, uh, this has been something on my mind as I've attended uh, SRLS for some time. Uh, so uh, let's, <clears throat> okay, so this is a little personal, personal background. M uh, much of this Dennis already said, so I won't, I won't belabor that. Um, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, this uh, top two thirds of this Dennis is pretty much already said, uh, but just by way of a little background, I'm a Midwesterner by birth. I was born and raised in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, uh, I, I am a bioinorganic chemist, and blessed by marriage to another bioinorganic chemist, Goodrum John Rogers, who is a research professor here at NDSU. Um, and insofar as it's relevant to this audience uh, and to the topic that I'm going to talk about and the lens through which I view it. I hold an atheistic view of the universe and I consider myself to be a secular humanist. By way of a little background, uh, I'm gonna kind of work up to the impetus for this um, <clears throat> talk. I've been attending the Science, Religion and Lunch Seminar since 2007. I know this because I went back and looked at the notes from my very first uh, seminar um, because I was, I was looking for quotes um, and, and so the first one was that here. Um, and throughout the time that I've been attending, there have been quite a few times when uh, SRLS speakers have used the language of modern scientific inquiry in ways that I, I thought was a little bit confusing. And, and I've, I've kind of perceived these, uh, these, I'll call them incidences, fall into two general categories. Um, and again, this is my perception, it's not necessarily fact. Uh, one of them is what I'll call innocent misappropriation of terms and language uh, uh, of scientific in inquiry. And, and that I think stems from uh, some lack of awareness, perhaps a lack of understanding of how science actually works uh, from, from the point of view of a practitioner. And, and I think there have been some times, and these have been mostly speakers from outside the university who come with an ax to grind, uh, I suspect that they have been intentional misappropriations uh, with the intent to mislead the audience. And so as I was sort of getting my mind right uh, in the language of Cool Hand Luke for, for this talk, um, I, I did a little bit of reading about misinformation and uh, spreading of that. And I, I came across a, a bunch of papers in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences uh, from uh, the Arthur Sackler Colloquium on, on uh, si uh, Science and Science of Communication. So this was held in 2017, it was the third one. <clears throat> and this is a quote from one of those papers, of course, citizens can be uninformed, 
and misinformed all at once. For example, they may be uniformed about, or sorry, uninformed about how scientific processes work while being misinformed about the facts of the specific scientific issue. And these factors may influence one another, so they're coupled or can be. Uh, in practice, then, it is difficult to cleanly separate the misinformed from the uninformed. And I, I put this up here right now because um, I, I kind of feel like uh, where where this really where this really matters, um, whether a person is uninformed or misinformed, may not make that much difference from a societal point of view. The result is the same. And I think this has real implications for public policy. If one knows what to listen for when listening to elected officials or politicians or talking heads on the, on the television or radio, misappro similar misappropriations of the language of science are also easily recognized in, in the utterings of politicians, elected officials. Um, <clears throat> if one does not really know what to listen for, those misappropriations, whether they're innocent or nefarious, uh, can really hobble society's collective ability to critically evaluate political rhetoric on science-based controversy, and therefore whether public policy enacted on its basis is reasonable or in the best interest of its citizens. So, um, so, so I'm, I'm sort of drawing a line between my perceived uh, extent of misunderstanding among the general public about the workings of science and uh, uh, a hobbled machine for implementing reasonable public policy on those issues. So what is the impetus for my asking Dennis if I could lead this discussion? Um, so my perception as a, as a practicing scientist and science educator uh, uh, of a widespread misunderstanding of science, um, my perception or my sense of how that misunderstanding can frustrate public discourse and stifle implementation of sound public policy, and uh, my perception of the value of what I'll call a good bullshit meter that plugged into a pragmatic sense of science, what it is, what it is not, and what it is good for. So the goals of this discussion are fairly straightforward. Uh, I'll be a little bit verbose. Um, I'd like to explain with an extremely brief historical context uh, that science is just a general method for inquiry through which we aim to grow and expand our knowledge and understanding of the universe. I will try to make the case that scientific inquiry does not and cannot prove any explanation for uh, uh, an observed or perceived aspect of the universe. And the reason for that is that Proof requires that we be absolutely certain of an explanation in order to be certain that it's the only one. We have to know what all of the possible explanations are, which is very unlikely. And then we'll consider some examples in which I think misunderstanding uh, the products and outcomes of scientific inquiry, um, uh, which are, of course, tentative and transient, as we'll talk about, uh, are inhibiting the kind of productive public discourse that's necessary uh, for sound public policy. So. Um, and, and, and by sound public policy, I'll say that a couple of times throughout the talk, what I mean there is a policy that serves the best interest of our world's people. So here's the history slide. See all those isms, Dennis? <laughs> <laughs> so um, from, from my, my perspective, and I'm not a philosopher, um, and I'm not a serious student of the history of science, uh, but uh, one doesn't have to read too much to realize that uh, scientific inquiry has, has sort of meandered through many schools of philosophical thought uh, in, in, in the past several uh, centuries, um, including mysticism, rationalism, skepticism, empiricism, critical rationalism, falsificationism, and uh, most recently uh, 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 some thoughts about the relationship between scientific revolutions, paradigm shifts, and incommensurability, which speaks to uh, the inability to really compare paradigms that are uh, profoundly different. From, from my point of view, um, as, as I read this history, I think modern methods of, of scientific inquiry really are um, a convolution of 
uh, many of the tenets of those schools of thought. Um, and so I, I don't think the history has really just bounced from one to the other, constantly improving all aspects every time. Uh, uh, scientific inquiry today uh, takes bits from uh, quite a few of these philosophies. All right, so what are the elements of scientific inquiry? Um, they're based on observation and evidence. Um, uh, we, we, we pursue an understanding through the testing of hypotheses, and hypotheses are, uh, by definition, a tentative explanation for an observation or a phenomenon or some scientific problem that can be tested by further investigation. Uh, the next point is in italics because I think it's important. A valid hypothesis should be based on some observation or information. Okay? Uh, in other words, it has to have some basis in, in, in uh, uh, information or fact. It must also be falsifiable through experimental testing or gathering of other empirical evidence. And so I, I distinguish between those because I don't mean to give short shrift to the social sciences that don't typically do laboratory experiments like I do. So I, I, I try a little bit hard not to uh, think just about laboratory work. In scientific inquiry, in, inquiries, uh, hypotheses are continually revised. They are retested as understanding grows. And, and that, that re revising and retesting occurs through feedback loops. I'm going to show you some graphical pictures of how I think that works um, in, in just a minute. But that revision and retesting is generally based on empirical evidence, whether it's gathered from laboratory experiments or uh, from, from uh, other data that's available uh, from various sources. How do we assess, uh, in a practical sense, the level of understanding that, that one has achieved in a particular area? Well, it's really validated by the ability to predict outcomes in new situations using uh, new knowledge that, that has come from this iterative process. It's very important the results are disseminated so that others may uh, try to repeat them. Um, they can look at your presentation and see if it is uh, sound, if your work has been done correctly, um, and, and whether it is uh, sufficiently, uh, uh, whether the work has advanced sufficiently uh, to, to tell a reasonable story to the scientific community. And so uh, this is a graphic that, that uh, is on a, a, a Berkeley website that uh, does, I think, a pretty nice job of um, illustrating the, 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 the feedback loops in modern methods of scientific inquiry. And we, 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 we start kind of up at the top here, and these arrows are um, inputs uh, to, to the method. Uh, one, one says serendipity, personal notification, uh, uh, sorry, a motivation, um, uh, uh, new technology that makes it possible to make observations that weren't possible before, curiosity, and so forth. So these are all, uh, these are all inputs to uh, what, what this diagram calls exploration and discovery. <clears throat> and within that exploration and discovery, uh, we, we do a lot of things. We make observations. Um, we, we ask questions. We may ask questions of ourselves. We may ask questions of someone who has presented or published an observation uh, uh, in, in a professional forum. Um, uh, we, we may share our ideas um, uh, and, and, and we may actually go and, and do some reading, right? Go to the, go to the refereed literature and, and read to find out if you're really the first person to have this idea, or if you're a day late, day late and a dollar short. <clears throat> um, and once, once you sort of have your feet on the ground with regard to this new idea, um, then we can, we can kind of move down here to uh, what we're calling gathering and interpreting data. And that gathering and interpreting of data is centered around a hypothesis, even though it's really small print, uh, that's an important bubble right there. Um, and this hypothesis has to be, again, testable by experiment for gathering data, and it has to be falsifiable. Why does it have to be falsifiable? That's really all we can do, right? Since we can't prove something beyond the shadow of a doubt, 
All we can do is eliminate it as a possibility for explaining an observation, right? And so uh, within this gathering and interpreting data, we may go around a whole bunch of times, right? We may have to go around a few times to get the experiments figured out. We may have to go around a few times to figure out how to properly analyze uh, social science data. Um, uh, and, and then we may have to go around a few more times uh, to make sure that it's, our, our, our experiments are reproducible. And we might have somebody in our lab do the experiment and then have somebody else do it. Or I might call my friend at another university and say, hey, can you try this and see if this works for you, right? Um, and so we continue here um, un until uh, basically we, we either conclude that we can't falsify the hypothesis or we succeed in falsifying the hypothesis. If we succeed, then we kind of go back here and start over. Um, and and if, we, if we can't falsify it, then we revise the hypothesis so that we can subject it to a new set of experiments uh, in, in an attempt to falsify that one. And somewhere along the line, we actually shoot over here into this uh, magenta uh, circle, uh, which is sort of the community analysis and feedback. This is where we present our work. Maybe we go to conferences. Um, maybe we go, maybe, maybe I go visit a colleague in another institution to give a seminar. We have a discussion of this, this area of research. Um, I publish a paper. There are all kinds of ways you can disseminate this information. You can, it disseminated narrowly, you can disseminate it widely. And whether you do that will probably depend upon the confidence that you have in what, in what the results say. And so this involves peers looking at your work, right? And they, they may say, wow, this is really something. Um, uh, I think there's really something here. But on, on this one page, uh, the author says something that just doesn't make sense to me. It seems to contradict what gets said on the previous page. Um, or for some reason, I can't see how this, this, these data support that conclusion. So they send back comments, right? And the author has to address those comments, either by clarifying the writing or doing more work to clarify the results. And if that totally bombs, right? So that is to say, your peers say, boy, <laughs> Ken, you're just off the edge of the map here, right? Um, and, and here's why, right? Well, you don't go back here. You just do a shortcut back up to the original observation and you kind of start over, right? That doesn't happen very often, but it does happen sometimes. <clears throat> um, and then the other thing that can happen is uh, from, from here, we can swing over and start talking about the applicability of the work that we've done. What can we do? What's it good for, right? Um, can we can we work with somebody to make a new device? Um, can we interface with an expert in another field uh, who we could work together with to do something that would have real societal benefit that maybe we couldn't do ourselves? That sort of thing. Okay, so I ho hopefully you get the idea. That this is a that this is a very iterative and sometimes recursive. Uh, set of cycles. And, and I, I just want to go through a couple of points here that I think are quite important. The iterative aspect of scientific inquiry is not an exercise just to gather evidence to prove what I'll call a cherished hypothesis or a theory. It does not do that. In, in this cycle of scientific inquiry, iteration is the means by which tentative explanations, those are the hypotheses, um, and the less tentative explanations would be theories, are disproved and revised, refined, or replaced. And any of those things can happen, right? We can either revise, as I discussed earlier, uh, we can refine because our understanding is, is getting better, or we, we abandon the hypothesis and just start over. The last thing, last point I want to make here is that science as a process is introspective. That is to say, it is self-refining, self-correcting, um, and, and uh, it, it often yields knowledge in terms of probabilities, not definitive things, but likelihoods. Okay? And <clears throat> this, last, this last comment 
is a real problem for a lot of people, um, especially when it comes to controversial, controversial current events. We'll come back to that. So I wanted to sort of compare science with pseudoscience, and I couldn't really find any figures, so I, I just sort of made, tried to make a line drawing here. Just remind you, scientific inquiry systematically eliminates potential explanations by their falsification. It involves disproving or falsifying false explanations as a way of getting closer to a useful explanation of the natural world. And so I've sort of drawn this layered funnel here, right? Uh, large, large cross-sectional area at the top and a little one at the bottom. And at the top, I put sort of the sea of possible explanations for some observation. Now we call those hypotheses. And uh, through that uh, uh, iterative cycle that we just talked about, you know, we, we, we kind of investigatively bounce around this funnel. Uh, and you, you notice we can, we can kind of descend down to where uh, the, the possible explanations are getting smaller in number and we, we might get stuck, right? And we may have to go back up and find another one and start over. Um, and so there's a very uh, 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 circuitous and nonlinear path to go from hypotheses, which we may set forth in quite a few number, uh, to what we'll call theories, which are uh, uh, really, you could think of them as super hypotheses. They, they uh, have broader applicability. Uh, they are much more likely than a hypothesis to provide you the basis for an accurate prediction uh, in a new circumstance. Um, and so as, as we increase the number of iterations, we kind of descend down this funnel uh, and we increase the likelihood that the explanation we come up with by the time we're at a theory is, uh, I use the word correct, although that's not really the best word, uh, but uh, let's call it useful. Pseudoscience is different. I think uh, Hopper talks about this in a really nice way, I think. Um, uh, in pseudoscience, the investigator attempts to gather just huge amounts of data, usually in a futile attempt to prove a theory or to filter the data in a way that one identifies what parts of the data are consistent with the theory and more or less ignore the rest. So that is not science, uh, that we would call pseudoscience. <clears throat> and and what, what's the problem here? Well, you know, we're, we're kind, of, kind of gathering an enormous amount uh, and taking it as evidence to support the theory without an honest attempt to falsify. And the only way you can know whether your hypothesis is of any value at all is if it's falsifiable, right? If you can't falsify it, it's really not very useful because your, your, your inquiry or your theory stagnates. It can't go anywhere, right? You can't improve your understanding if you can't prove any part of it false because you got nowhere to go. So science and pseudoscience. There are some pretty infamous deviations from uh, scientific methods of inquiry by scientists. We generally refer to those that I just said as pseudoscience. Sometimes it's called pathological science. Um, there are lots of websites where you can read about this stuff. Uh, so I just want to give a couple, a couple of examples. So uh, uh, in pseudoscience, as I said, data are gathered with the goal of supporting or improving hypothesis or theory. Perhaps, perhaps this is due to some preconceived idea. Um, who knows why? Uh, but but this is done rather than uh, operating with the goal of falsifying it. A lot of people say that uh, uh, Freudian psychology suffered from this method of, of uh, verification of a theory. <clears throat> um, avoidance of peer review turns out to occur once in a while, and there are some pretty recent examples of this that were uh, uh, colossally bad news for the, for the scientists. One of them uh, is the cold fusion debacle that happened uh, about 25 years ago. Um, there, there are times when independent reproducibility can't be or won't be demonstrated by uh, the investigators. Uh, they won't do control experiments. They'll only let one person in the lab do this because they have magic hands and they're the only ones that can make it happen. That's always a bad, a bad thing. And, and uh, there, are a couple of, uh, there, there are a couple of famous instances of this. Uh, You've ever heard of polywater homeopathic medicine? Um, both, both of those uh, scientific debacles suffered from uh, from this reproducibility and lack of control experiments. So when you when you when you go off the map 
uh, provided by this, this uh, uh, iterative cycle of scientific inquiry, uh, one can get oneself in, in real trouble, especially. Well, sometimes people just skip the method altogether. And uh, we all know examples of this. Um, and, and it happens because people confuse correlation for causation. Um, and so that's why you often hear people say in introductory science courses, probably in philosophy of science courses, correlation is not causation. Be careful, don't fall into this sticky trap because it's pretty easy to do if you're not careful. So what does this mean? It means that spatial or temporal correlation between two events or observation does not mean that they have a cause and effect relationship, even though it's tempting to think that. Um, it's important to recognize that uh, correlation, if you observe it or recognize it, is an empirical observation, right? This is where scientific inquiry begins, not where it ends. And so uh, recognizing a correlation is up at the top of that red circle on our, on our diagram of, of a couple of screens back, okay? Um, and so, you know, scientists and non-scientists alike fall into this trap uh, and they erroneously equate correlation with causation. And, and if, if you think about it in, in terms of the, of the methodology diagrams, what we're essentially doing is bypassing the whole systematic method for building knowledge. I just have a couple of examples of this. I always show this to my freshmen in chemistry. Um, so uh, take it as a, an example. This. Here, here's, here's the ice cream man. We hear him driving around Fargo all the time uh, with the jingle playing. So ice cream vendors drive around Fargo selling ice cream only on a stick, only in the summer, right? So you can only get that in the summer. Most people would agree it's hot here in the summer. Not always hot, but it's, it's pretty warm. It's pretty warm. Ice cream sales and hot summer days are temporally and spatially correlated. Therefore, ice cream vendors cause the summer to be hot, right? Um, well, that's kind of kind of goofy. <laughs> I mean, no, no critically thinking person would, would agree with that, but it, it, it provides a nice illustration of how sideways your thinking can go if you, if you fall into this trap. So here's one that you know about. We were talking about it before in the seminar today. So in the, in the 80s and 90s, there was a rise in the rate of autism in California uh, that was temporarily correlated with the use of vaccines preserved with thiomerosol. For those of you who are interested in chemical structure, this is the, this is the formula or the structure of thiomerosol. It's an organomercury compound. It's a preservative uh, with antimicrobial and antifungal activity, and it, was why it has been widely used for many, many, many years. At one point, I think it was in the 60s, it was considered one of the most important chemicals produced in the world because of these, these preservative properties. <clears throat> so if you look at this plot, you see uh, uh, the, 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 they call it prevalence, but it's actually the rate of autism in the population, cases per 10,000 uh, as a function of a year. Okay. Um, and, and so uh, the, 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 the the, the dotted line here is, is the rate of autism as a function of year, and the bar graph underneath it shows um, the thiomersal load among children who are getting vaccinated for measles, bumps, and rubella. So it's pretty compelling, right? I mean, you look at the shape of this line, and you, you look at the shape of, across the top of the bars, and think, gee whiz, that's pretty compelling. Um, but you have to remember, correlation alone does not constitute evidence for causation. If you want to find out if there's evidence, you have to do experiments, right? You have to, or you have to gather data, right? You have to do something to eliminate other possible explanations for the correlation. Maybe it has to do with uh, uh, the places where the people who got sampled live. I mean, there are all kinds of variables that aren't apparent just from looking at this plot. Well, it turns out that the guy who did this, name's Wakefield, um, published this in the Lancet. Uh, the, the number of people that were uh, used in this study is very small. Turns out 
can't remember the fraction, but it was on the order of half of the kids um, were autistic before they ever got a vaccine. So, I mean, it's, it was a mess. It was an absolute mess. So this guy ended up losing his license to practice medicine. He had to retract this paper and he's living somewhere in disgrace. <clears throat> okay, so what's the deal with correlations? Correlations are not the results of scientific inquiry. Uh, they're not sufficient to support uh, conclusions um, or, or the, the, uh, themselves or, or the, uh, the establishment of knowledge. Um, they're not sufficient to support some public policy. What they are is observations. Um, they are often sufficient to support hypotheses and therefore they are really entry points into scientific inquiry. And this is a message I think that scientists need to get out to their friends, neighbors, and relatives when these sorts of topics are talked about. Those correlations aren't the answers. Uh, they're the toehold to find the answers. Okay, folks, so for the rest of the discussion, which will be uh, quite short, uh, we'll explore the relationships between some well-known and current controversies uh, and scientific inquiry. And, and the ones we'll talk about are vaccine hesitancy, which stems from that, that horrid study in, uh, some time ago, um, like 90, 94, I can't remember, um, and, and climate change. So quite a few people, including fossil fuel companies, um, and members of Congress do not accept the causative relationship between climate change and human activity. This in spite of the, cons of the consensus among the community of experts that the evidence for causation is overwhelming and growing. <clears throat> and we won't talk about that evidence, but, but it's, it's a big body of evidence. So as is typical in scientific inquiry, the climate change story continues to be refined. The problem with this in a political environment is that the skeptics, and they may be skeptical for any number of reasons, right? Might be, have something to do with personal wealth. Uh, might, who, who knows what it is? Um, uh, skeptics interpret this changing story over an observable period of time uh, to mean that the research community is, is playing politics uh, in order to gain political favor rather than uh, the, the natural outcome of the scientific process. And when this happens, expertise of researchers tends to be undermined by conspiracy theories that are, that are loaded with accusations of collusion with other experts and fabrication of results. Well, of course, if you go back to the scientific method thing, right? The diagram. What's one of the things you have to do? To talk with other experts, right? That's what we do. Um, and that's how we make sure that our own thinking isn't, isn't going sideways. Um, so, so just by practicing a sound scientific process, uh, these, these people are being demonized. So the fossil fuel industry um, is to push back on public policy that could address the causes of climate change. It's pretty clear that the reasons for that are uh, responsibility stockholders. Uh, I'll, sh I'll show you why I think that in a minute. Um, this, uh, this, they, they practice a delay uh, in congressional action through lobbyists. They sow doubt in the public mind about the science of climate change, and they do very well at deflecting any responsibility that they have for doing uh, the first two for, uh, for contributing to climate change. This really exploits that general lack of public understanding about science and how science works that I talked about at the very beginning. Um, uh, it, because uh, it seems that many people in the general public don't recognize that it's perfectly natural and beneficial for our knowledge of a particular issue to get deeper and deeper as time goes on. So uh, this guy, Keith McCoy, who was a, a, a lobbyist for ExxonMobil, uh, turns out recently got duped by somebody from Greenpeace. So this guy from Greenpeace called him up and, and made like a headhunter, like he wanted to talk to him about an alternate job. And so this guy was just effusive uh, about 
what, what the company had been doing with regard to uh, delay, uh, doubt, and deflect uh, in, in climate change. So I won't play because I'm about I'm really out of time, but uh, if, you, if you get your hands on that link, uh, there, there's a recording of, of, the, uh, of the interview. By contrast to climate change, Virtually unsupported claims of cause and effect between the onset of autism and childhood vaccinations are embraced <clears throat> by a large anatomic group of people all over the world, right? So here you have something that's completely false, <clears throat> totally unsubstantiated, and people can't let it go. It's very strange. Um, so unlike the groups that marginalize climate science, there seems to be no real financial incentive among members of the general public uh, to undermine public health. I'm not sure why, why they want to do that. Um, uh, the, the only thing that I can, the only conclusion I can come to here uh, is that, that this comes from a lack of understanding. The 1998 Lancet article by, by Wakefield that we talked about, that's the one that was withdrawn. Um, even though it's gone, even though he is out of the medical profession, the effects of that of that study, that bad study, uh, continue to, to to drive a wedge between uh, fanaticism and public health. It's just remarkable. So I don't know. It doesn't seem logical that this that, that this is mistrust of an untrustworthy scientist because there's nothing to trust, right? The guy is gone. His work is gone. Uh, I, I, I again come to the conclusion that this is just simply poor understanding of how science works and what it's good for. So I did some snooping around. Um, uh, I, I remember years ago listening to, uh, listening to Michelle Bachman on the house floor talk about carbon dioxide. So when I, when I dug around and found that quote, I found all these other ones. Um, and so I, in, in red, without going through all of them, but uh, in detail, in red are the, are the things that, that uh, set up a red flag to me that this person doesn't really understand what they're talking about, yet they're doing it in a very public forum uh, that gives them a tremendous amount of influence. Um, and so um, real science doesn't say we have any major crisis or threat, suggesting that uh, the science is, is faked or, or fraudulent. Uh, Herman Cain, in the 2011 campaign, Michelle Bachman, carbon dioxide is not a harmful gas. It's a harmless gas. Um, well, I think we should tie her up in a plastic bag with some CO2 and leave her there for a while, see how it comes out for her. Um, um, this, this, this one really gets to me, really gets me. And, and, and you, see, you hear this a lot. I couldn't find any more quotes and I, I wish I'd been writing them down over the last couple of years. Uh, but this, this is uh, Ron Paul, talking about the theory of evolution and, and his non-acceptance of it. Um, uh, and, and, you know, I just don't think we're at the point where anybody has absolute proof on either side. What, really? What does that mean? What that means is if he requires absolute proof, yeah, he's whistling in the wind. He's gonna, he's gonna, he's gonna die in ignoramus, right? Um, so uh, it's, it's that sort of uh, lack of understanding of what science does uh, that, that keeps people from using it uh, for something useful, I think. So the public policy problem uh, stems uh, from, from the mentality that Tom Friedman uh, addresses in this quote. I really like this quote. Well, widely followed public figures feel free to say anything without any fact checking. It becomes impossible for a democracy to think intelligently about big issues. Absolutely. So part of the public policy, policy solution, in my opinion, is education. Um, the only question is how do we become more effective at that education? That is a challenge. And I think it, it, it just requires um, diligence and vigilance on the part of people who do understand this and can, uh, can effectively communicate, okay? Um, so, uh, it, this is just a rehash of points I've made before, but I just do want to point out, and I put in a little bigger font here, this has worked in the past. You remember the issue? Pardon? No? You remember ozone depletion? So uh, uh, Roland and Molina finally won the Nobel Prize for this, and 
uh, after their character was assassinated multiple times by the industrial concerns involved, uh, uh, Congress finally got off the dime and implemented policy. And uh, while we do still have an ozone hole over Antarctica, it, it is not getting bigger anymore, right? So, uh, so this can work. All right, well, this is, this is just the wrap up slide. Uh, uh, science, what it is, it's a systematic and iterative method, emphasis on method for expanding and refining our knowledge and understanding of the universe. That knowledge and understanding is always transient. It's an important detail, I think, and one that not many people uh, really have in their mind. It's always transient because through falsification of hypotheses and theories, uh, science is auto-correcting and auto-refining uh, its, its uh, knowledge product. Science is not a means to unambiguous proof. And what is it good for? Uh, well, as we talked about at the end, uh, uh, so the product of science is all, uh, with, uh, science is and always will be incomplete knowledge and understanding of the universe. Nevertheless, I think if we can make the electorate realize that absolute proof is, is unattainable and get them to accept that, um, then, then they may, then society may become more comfortable with uh, moving forward on the basis of incomplete knowledge, as long as we can manage uh, to, to uh, inf let it inform public policy through careful and what I'll call good faith analysis of the risks, risks and benefits uh, involved in making those public policy decisions. All right, well, that's all I have. So thank you for listening and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you for a really good talk. Um, I'm not going to take time for applause because I, I see a large number of our folks are online. So I want to open it up to questions, but I'm going to be naughty and take the first one. Um, because when I'm looking at this, I'm going to ask you this, and maybe you don't have an answer to it. Do you think the media itself turns out to be a problem here? Because number one, they don't know the difference between certainty and probability. And so they're looking for absolute truths rather than looking for what's problem, the way science does. They don't also understand evidence, the criteria we require for evidence. So again, it would be absolute. And then I, I think there's sensationalization. So some of the studies I've, I've looked at, or heard that report, they get a one study and they make a certain conclusion. This study proves that this. When the scientists involved would say, no, it doesn't. <laughs> so first of all, do you agree? Or that's, that's an unfair so question. I, okay, so how would you address it? Yes, I agree in part. Um, I think there are members of the media who are, who are diligent and vigilant about, about how they present um, the results of scientific inquiry. They're in the minority in my, is my sense. Um, but you know, the, the Times and the Washington Post have some pretty good people, right? Um, but I, but I, I do think we're, we're in kind of a scary place with science and the media because um, many of the traditional media outlets are really in financial trouble and they really have to worry about readership and viewership. Um, I don't have a good sense of the extent to which that's true for some of the internet outlets. Um, some of them may be having trouble these days too. Um, but uh, so, so they are willing to be sloppy because it gets ratings. Um, and, and I don't know what you do about that. Um, uh, because those, those folks are, are trying to survive and doing whatever they can to do it. Um, but in their wake, you know, they're, they're leaving this, kind of leaving this mess. Uh, and so in that sense, I think uh, a lot of them are part of the problem. And I've even, you know, I've even uh, heard recently, and I, I wish I'd written this down because I can't remember exactly what it was, but um, it might've even been NPR reported on an unpublished scientific study. Um, oh, it was the Alzheimer's drug. That's what it was. It was the recent Alzheimer's drug um, that actually has been shown to dissolve plaques. Um, but they published it and started talking about it before it passed muster with a jury of the peers. 
And I think that's, that's on the scientists, in this case, on the drug companies. Um, you know, they, they're, 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 they're operating on dollar signs, um, not, not knowledge building. Uh, I have to deal with this with my kid. Uh, this fake news and everything that's around. I'm beginning to wonder people believe what they want to believe. And I think a lot of that is because our education system has not taught young people and adults to think critically. Uh, could you comment on that? That, that might be true. Um, so again, uh, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to say my mantra once more: correlation is not causation. Right. Um, and so while while there may be while there may be a cause and effect relationship between those two things, um, my guess is it's a little more complicated. Yeah, that's why I go back to it. It's what they want to believe. Uh, politically, look at the uh, Trump situation where a lot of population still thinks uh, the election was stolen from. And again, that's not fact. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure I'm convinced he thinks it was stolen. I, I think he just wants everybody else to think he thinks it was stolen, right? Because he <laughs> well, thinks, but he thinks it's, it's going to get him some traction. Uh, in, in, in the next election, um, you know, that's speculation. But so there are a number of comments in the chat. So KL, do you want to start up at the top, Kent? There, uh, your pseudoscience slide appears to apply to current quantum and astrophysics theory. I'm going to guess at what this is. I'm just reading, reading about string theory. That yes. there's no, when you get, oh, are you there? Yeah. Okay. Is it because they can't really test what they're saying at this level? I guess on that um, slide, everything was flowing to the bottom of the funnel to prove the theory where it appears from quantum and astrophysics, the more and more we learn, the darker and darker it gets. So it's flowing out of the top of the funnel instead of to something that can be theoretical. I have to say that I, I don't I don't feel like I have uh, any expertise in uh, modern in the theory of modern astrophysics or string theory. So um, I you know I would be talking out of my hat, which I'd prefer not to do. <laughs> <laughs> but, but by the way, that's a really good topic for science and religion lunch seminar in the future. Would be a good corollary talk to this yeah. one. Yeah. Roger, I'll ask the question this way, Dan. If you look at the size of atoms, why does there appear to be a maximum size to an atom? Why don't we see atom 227? Or element 227? You mean you mean why why do heavy elements why do there Heavy elements have less nuclear stability than the light atom or light elements. Is that what you're asking? Why does there appear to be a limit to the biggest element possible? Will we ever see an element 1001? Uh, I wouldn't venture a guess about that, but I mean, to, to, to address your question um, about why heavy nuclei are less stable than light nuclei. As I understand it, uh, that has to do with, uh, with, with the crossover between uh, the cohesive forces of the nuclear strong force and the electrostatic forces between the protons and the nucleus. And so when the electrostatic forces uh, overpower the strong force um, because they have a different distance dependence, uh, the the, the uh, electrostatic repulsion of the positive charge renders the nucleus unstable. I see we have a question by uh, Theodore uh, Kleeman about why people doubt science. I, I wouldn't say that I have a theory. I have speculation, uh, which I guess you could you could say is a hypothesis. And, and 
I, I, I sort of stated it during the talk, and, and I, think the, I think the problem is that both uh, many members of the general public, as well as the people that they listen to uh, in, in the halls of Congress, uh, on news programs, uh, with, the, with the exception of programs like NOVA and such, um, they, they are they are hearing things that are either blatantly incorrect or very confusing by virtue of poor context. That is to say, uh, the people who are saying them don't understand the context of scientific inquiry and, and what it means to the points that they're trying to make. So that, that, would, be, that would be why I think that's such a problem. And so, you know, you, you have to sort of, you know, as a, as a practicing science, I have to sort of step back and say, well, okay, you know, I think that's a little crazy, but, but it's reality. And so I have to ask myself, what, what is it that's going on that I'm involved in that's undermining uh, the taxpaying public's confidence in the product of scientific inquiry? Um, and and I, I think <clears throat> it has something to do with uh, not understanding that uh, the, 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 the knowledge product of scientific inquiry changes with a fairly steep slope. And if you don't understand that or appreciate it or value it, it looks like doublespeak, right? Um, and so if it looks like doublespeak and your elected officials are telling you it's doublespeak, and by the way, if you buy that double speak, your taxes are going to go up. Um, you know, all of a sudden, the scientific community starts to look pretty bad in the eyes of an uninformed electorate. As an observation, I, I think that the terms follow the science and I believe in science are probably two of the most overused and abused statements in my lifetime. And it seems to me that uh, if somebody expresses an opposing view, something different than you hear on the network news, they're immediately labeled a science skeptic. And as the first part of your talk very clearly said, scientists have to be skeptics. If you're not skeptical, you're not a good scientist. You're professional uh, skeptics. And, but then when you talked about climate change, your, your uh, slide sort of condemned skeptics of, of climate change, uh, which I thought was sort of odd. Uh, but, and, and the other comment, uh, or I guess uh, comment I would have, or I'd like to have your thought on is, it seems like so much with the COVID thing, with climate change thing, they're based on computer projections, which have been notoriously wrong for the last 30 years. And I wonder you know, what your thoughts are uh, when we base so much of what we're gonna do in the future based on these climate projections. I think the University of Washington did so much on the, the COVID thing and they weren't even close to being accurate. Uh, and yet we, you know, we set our national policy based on that information. It just seems like it's not a good idea. Yeah, I guess I would argue that we're not setting our national policy very well based on uh, uh, the, the outcomes of scientific inquiry right now. But but I, I take your point. Um, so on our so, so there so okay so there are two questions there. One is um, I I lauded skepticism as an important aspect of, of scientific inquiry. But then when I talked about climate deniers or climate skeptics, I was, I was sort of wagging my finger at them, right? That was, that was one question. Um, and um, so I, I would never wag my finger at somebody for being skeptical uh, just because they're skeptical, because I'm skeptical. So that would be, that would be hypocritical, right? Um, my, my frustration, with that is the same frustration that I have with people who don't want to get a vaccine is that uh, they, they, 
will not um, consider the evidence in, in, in their thinking, right? So there are a lot of people that have come right out even recently and said, there is no way under any circumstances I would take a vaccination against COVID-19. Um, and, and that's the end of it. There's no discussion. There's no thought, critical thought or any thought. It's just no. Um, so the, that's my problem with that. Regarding to the computer projection, when President Obama said science is settled. So I don't know oh, yeah. if science is settled. Again, <laughs> you know, he should have spoken a little more, a little more to this science advisor before he said that. <laughs> yeah. So we have one in the comment section. Uh, Mark McCourt, uh, a comment. I don't think the anti-science attitudes are simply because of ignorance. I think there is a motivation on the part of some to actively promulgate misinformation for the political or economic economic purposes. Also mentioned the Dunning Kruger effect played a role. Also mentioned what? The Dunning Kruger effect played a role. Uh, yes. Um, thanks, Mark. Um, I I'm. I'm not sure. I, I, I I'm not sure. I disagree with you, but I, I wouldn't state that with quite as much confidence. But um, you know, I, I I do agree that that there are some political leaders uh, around the world, including in the United States, who who see um, undermining of confidence in in uh, technical aspects of our life as as a way to uh, grab power, or as part of their strategy for grabbing power, and so I, I you know, I, I think that's probably true. Well, I have to do my duty. Unfortunately, um, there's a really good chat going on in the uh, uh, in Zoom, which I, I hate to, to finish, but uh, I can't keep our speaker too much longer. Um, I would, by the way, suggest when we're talking about skeptics. And what was said, when we're at equipoise, where we don't have very much evidence, then you can believe just about anything. But as evidence piles up, then it becomes a more extraordinary claim to go against the evidence. So we have, it, because that's how science moves. And then if I, I said, no, the earth is flat, I guess there's a basketball player who thinks that. That's an extraordinary claim that requires extraordinary evidence. Not just to sit, pull it out of your butt anymore, <laughs> but we've got a lot of stuff that's going against you. Anyways, on that low note, I want I want to go back to Heidi. Thank you for a really great talk. I wish we could get a lot of people to see this because I think it would be beneficial for them to understand how science actually works. So thank you. A week or two weeks from today, Tyler Waltz will be giving a talk December fourteenth. By the way. The director of the Theodore Roosevelt Presidential Library will be talking to us about making that library sustainable, which I think is an important thing uh, for the library to be. So that's not done yet, but uh, it's in the works. So we'll see you later. Have a wonderful day. And thanks for coming in person.